Well, this is a uh, just a amazing, mind-blowing topic uh, we're about to get into. You might remember we had Brad Schreiber on the show with us before. He has that highly acclaimed book, Becoming Jimi Hendrix. Great book. Won lots of awards. Uh, he created the true TV series, North Mission Road, which ran six seasons based on his L.A. coroner. And his new book, Revolution's End, the Patty Hearst kidnapping, mind control, and the secret history of Donald DeFries and the SLA. The title kind of paints a picture. What an amazing story. Brad, it's great to have you back on. It's great to be back with you, Alan. Thank you very much. The show, the, the information in this book is so mind-blowing, and you document everything so well. I, I can't wait to really devour the book. I haven't had a chance other than just kind of uh, get the, getting the gist of it, but I look forward to reading every word. So I want you to feel free to elaborate. But before yeah. we get into the nuts and bolts and, and kind of refresh everybody's memory about Patty Hearst, I guess at one point you were looking at all the news and all the, the militars, milita, <laughs> militarization. I can't get the word out. Militas. Well, you know what it is. I'll put it in here <laughs> later. But, but you watch what's happening in Ferguson and in Charlotte and all the cases in between. And you watch the way police actually respond to the public. There's no doubt about it. It's almost like they're invading a country. It's not like it's American citizens. It's like it's, they're talking to enemies. So you felt this very same thing to the point where you mentioned it's almost sickening. Talk about that. Well, it's true that for 40 years, nobody ever told the full story about what really went on in the Patricia Hearst kidnapping in 1974. And I kept waiting for a documentary or a film or even a book to get into the intelligence connections to the creation of the SLA. And as you just said, Alan, one of the important byproducts of writing Revolution's End is making a connection between the shootout and fire in May of 1974 that killed six members of the SLA in South Central Los Angeles, including its leader, Donald DeFries, and the fact that that moment in history, which, by the way, was broadcast on live television nationally for two hours, a shootout between f about 500 officers and those uh, six people inside, that that moment changed American history, not just the history of radical politics in California. Because what happened is everyone watching the broadcast networks saw the, the implementation of SWAT. Special weapons and tactics had not been used in a national context um, until that moment. Mm -hmm. And SWAT, of course, wiped out those people, and as a result, the LAPD started receiving calls from police departments across America. And those calls basically were, we saw what happened with the automatic weapons and the Kevlar and all of the other material that your SWAT teams used during the shootout in South Central Los Angeles. We want to hire you to train us in those very same tactics. And that was the beginning of police militarization in America. And it all came by this horrible quirk of fate when the Symbionese Liberation Army a supposed left-wing radical group, was actually created as an intelligence operation. And it was done so because of all the anti-war radicals, and especially because of the Black Panthers and their power in California. It's amazing, because it it's such a vivid story in my mind, and I remember, I don't know if I watched it live, but it was just blowing everybody's mind. People were talking about it. And to think that the CIA created this thing in the first place. It's um, yeah. uh, Go ahead and talk about the, the, how, has the story continued and how Donald DeFries, the former LAPD informant, uh, he was a convict, a victim of 
a behavior modification. They were kind of playing with his head and what it led to. Yeah. This is the reason I wrote the book. Um, a lot of people were fascinated that Patty Hearst and Eris uh, was kidnapped and then became part of this supposed left-wing gang, the SLA. What I knew, basically, and the alternative press knew in 1970s, was that Donald DeFries had been an informant for the, con- the criminal conspiracy section of the Los Angeles Police Department. And his job, after being caught as a criminal, was to be an informant and to sell guns to Black Panthers um, in South Central Los Angeles and set them up for arrest. Um, Inevitably, DeFries was so incompetent that they sent him to the California Medical Facility at Vacaville. Vacaville is a really interesting place. It was kind of a, a horrific... Um, government-run hospital, where not only were were convicts kept there, but they were experimented upon. They got them to sign uh, informed consent so that legally uh, the hospital and the prison Mm -hmm. were, were not legally liable for anything. But literally... People going through Vacaville were supposed to be there 30 to 60 days. Donald DeFries was in there over two years. And the reason is because he was one of the few convicts who was cooperative. He was not political. Mm. He was not outspoken. And newspapers like the Berkeley Barb um, proved back in the day that he was given a drug called prolixin, a horrible drug that stays in your system two weeks and grinds you down, it makes you pace, it makes you, you know, desperate to, to rest. And Vacaville, Alan, was a house of horrors. They did psychosurgery there. They used all kinds of horrible drugs on prisoners. And um, it was in Vacaville that this really fascinating character, Colston Westbrook, who had been a CIA officer in the Phoenix program in Vietnam, where Colston Westbrook showed up and created what was called the Black Cultural Association, the BCA. Now, here's where the story connects to directly to Ronald Reagan and his uh, cabinet. When Colston Westbrook was a CIA agent in Vietnam, he knew a guy named William Herman, H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N. William Herman winds up being the head of counterintelligence for Ronald Reagan as governor of California and invites Colston Westbrook, after he cycles out of Vietnam, to set up the Black Cultural Association at Vacaville. Ostensibly, what it looked like was a group of black prisoners at Vacaville who would meet twice a week and talk about issues concerning convicts, and they would invite white, young radicals from the Bay Area. Now remember, Alan, in 1973-74, the San Francisco Bay Area was the nexus of anti-American leftist radical politics. So you ask yourself, why would any prison in the Bay Area allow black prisoners to start having rap sessions, as they called them, with white radicals. Yeah. Well, ostensibly, it was to promote um, expression, free expression, from black prisoners who were intimidated and threatened all the time. Really what it was, was an opportunity for Colston Westbrook, a very brilliant and charming black guy who was using the cover of the African American Studies uh, program as a teacher's assistant at UC Berkeley. That was his part-time job. He supposedly volunteered at Vacaville and had lists of all the white radicals who were invited to talk to the black convicts at California Medical Facility Vacaville. And what he was doing was looking for a convict who would cooperate with him and secretly set up a group of white radicals to follow him 
then allow DeFries to break out of prison and inevitably, without the white radicals knowing, he would create um, irresponsible acts that would undermine the power of radicals in the Bay Area and the Black Panthers. And this worked very well. Yeah, so they could point a finger and say, look, these people are terrible. Look what they're doing in the media. Absolutely. And in the Bay Area in the 70s, while there were plenty of leftist groups that advocated the overthrow of the government, they were not holding up banks. And they certainly were not murdering uh, the first black superintendent of schools in Oakland, Dr. Marcus Foster, which was the first action that the SLA took in November 1973. Even members of the SLA have gone on record. Russell Little directly confronted DeFries. Now remember, there's this weird dynamic, because at that time, with frustration about racism and the war in Vietnam, the Bay Area radical community made black prisoners the vanguard of a movement. George Jackson, the famous writer and convict, had been murdered. And radicals there were looking to black prisoners to fill that void and to tell them what to do. And because they chose, because Colston Westbrook guided Donald DeFries to run this new SLA, the white followers were afraid to challenge him. It was, you don't dare question the ideas or the methods of a man who supposedly has broken out of prison and is a quote-unquote political prisoner. Mm -hmm. It was the term that they used back then. Now, in, in case your listeners are wondering, where does Brad get all this crazy stuff from some weird website somewhere? Okay, I would say to your listeners, I hope that the New York Times is a sufficient source for you. Because it was the day of the shootout in South Central, May 17, 1974, that John Kiffner, writing in the New York Times, confirmed that Donald DeFries had been um, in Vacaville, and there was behavior modification done on him, that he had been an informant for the LAPD, and that Colston Westbrook had been a CIA agent not only in Vietnam, but he had traveled throughout Southeast Asia, including Thailand and Cambodia and, and other countries. Oh, man. So, so as crazy as what I'm telling you sounds, a lot of this story was confirmed in the 70s, and nobody except the alternative press paid attention to it. And Kiffner, to his credit, wrote about it, but... It was the same day of the shootout, and after those six members were killed, uh, the storyline became Patty Hearst. Where's Patty Hearst? Sadly, the American press didn't say, we'll catch Patty Hearst inevitably. Who is Colston Westbrook? What is going on at Vacaville? Why was the SLA created, and why do all the radical groups in the San Francisco Bay Area accuse this group of being a false front. I remember Let's that's a, You're right. The focus was Patty Hearst. Wow. At one point, you just you had to figure out, is she in on it? What's going on? She was kidnapped, but nothing behind the scenes. You're absolutely right. That's a part of history. By the way, if you just tuned in, Brad Schreiber is talking about his provocative new book. Uh, it's called Revolutions End. It is out bradschreiber.com true documented throughout so continue so yeah patty hearst now is involved that's where the media is focusing and she had a sexual relationship with uh, the freeze and i guess how she got hooked up in this yeah she's completely innocent as far as i'm concerned of uh, she should never have done any time of course it's patty hearst the the white heiress to uh, Randolph Hearst, who owned the publishing empire, who got the story splashed all over um, papers and TV, and basically it was a worldwide story, Alan, when it hit. She was sort of the hook. 
But really, lying below the surface was Reagan, his attorney general, Evel Younger, and the director of the California Department of Corrections, Raymond Procunier, all saying, we've got to do something about these black prisoners who are creating and fomenting rebellion. How can we do it? And it was a combination of certain CDC officers, specifically one guy named Lieutenant James Nelson, and Colston Westbrook, who, who helped create the SLA and then ran DeFreeze as an agent. Patty visited him because she was a closet radical. She was a, a rich girl who believed in um, the radical left's ideology, but of course she was going to get married and she wasn't about to, you know, perform any radical activities, but what she did do is use a friend's ID from UC Berkeley and secretly visit Donald DeFries when he was at Vacaville and when he was later transferred to Soledad Prison. All this stuff is documented by Lake Headley. Lake Headley was one of the great private investigators of the era. In fact, Remember Vincent Bugliosi, the guy who handled sure. the Manson murders? Absolutely, we've had him on. A brilliant, brilliant prosecutor. Vincent Bugliosi said Lake Headley is the best private investigator on earth. And uh, Headley's book, Vegas P.I., as well as great journalism by a guy named Dick Russell, who I'll tell you about in a minute in helping me to write revolutions and with his important research, Dick Russell and Lake Headley have both documented that Patty Hearst was visiting and having a relationship with Donald DeFries while he was in prison. Donald DeFries, remember, is a snitch. So the prison officials are saying, if you will snitch on us, if you will help us organize this group, the SLA, we will give you preferential treatment. What was the preferential treatment that Donald DeFries got at Vacaville and Soledad? They allowed him to deal marijuana, and they allowed him to use trusty trailers to have sex with white radical women who were visiting and hmm. had no idea about the intelligence operations going on. So, yeah, they, they, they were fine with that. The prison went along with it. They did it. They allowed Donald DeFries to have sex in trusty trailers which were only meant for convicts who were well-behaved and were given conjugal visits with their wives. Right. So here they are allowing Donald DeFries to use those trailers, and who was visiting them? Not only Patty Hearst, but Patricia Soltisic and Nancy Ling Perry, who, not surprisingly, wind up becoming part of the SLA. And... As you read Revolution's End, you'll see that Colston Westbrook is, is sometimes amusing and sometimes infuriating, but he's really quite brilliant. As I said, he was a, he was a CIA agent, but he also spoke seven languages, including Swahili. And whenever in the press uh, during this whole crazy SLA period, some journalists said, hey, we have documentation that you were in the CIA. Not only would he deny it, but he would flip the script on people and accuse them of being racist for asking about his intelligence background. And this guy was so brilliant that he manipulated DeFries and then went into the press when, when DeFries had kidnapped Patty Hearst Colston Westbrook went into the world of journalism and gave lots of interviews. You would think you're a CIA agent. You helped create a secret group. The last thing you want to do is talk to anyone in the press. But this guy's ego was so big, that, and he was so confident hmm. that he loved conducting interviews. And you'll see a bunch of his quotes scattered throughout Revolution's End. And he talked in street lingo, including what we now refer to as the N-word, which he used all the time. And this is a guy who is exceptionally brilliant, and he was talking like he was a quote-unquote gangster. And he kept changing 
the nature of the narrative and saying, well, you know, DeFries is just a punk and, you know, he's a radical and he hated white people. He literally, Colston Westbrook literally said in an interview, well, DeFries hates white people. Oh, really? Then why is he running a radical organization made up only of white people? Right. Unbelievable. So that was, the, that was Colston Westbrook's job, not only to guide white radicals toward DeFries without their knowing that this SLA was an intelligence operation, but also to sort of maintain the narrative in the press. And all that ended when um, basically uh, Donald DeFries issued one of the many communiques from the SLA and identified Colston Westbrook. And it, this was in the San Francisco Chronicle and, and, and then covered in papers across the country. Mm-hmm. Colston Westbrook identified as a CIA agent. And strangely, at that point, uh, DeFries knew, okay, now I really am a radical. I can't tell these white followers, but they support me, and now I'm on the run, and they're probably going to come to get me. So I'm going to live the rest of my life really as a radical rather than as a police agent. It's just a mind-boggling, amazing story. And, and it's... Oh, I'm finish yeah. your sentence. Go ahead. Finish your thought. And, well, and, and the, the final part of it is, you know, in the mid-'70s when I was fascinated by this, I wasn't fascinated so much by Patty Hearst. Um, yes, it was interesting that she was coerced in a, in a bank robbery, and, and legally we can talk about that and the trial. But really I thought, what must it be like to be Donald DeFries a failed criminal, a police agent who is forced against his will to commit murder, then identifies his CIA control agent and realizes he's going to be killed and then goes, okay, I guess I really am a a revolutionary. It's unparalleled in the history of intelligence. And, of course, as we said earlier, uh, the shootout then changed the nature of police militarization and, of course, wiped out any effectiveness that the new left had in America. When that picture went around the world of Patty Hearst holding a machine gun, I, as I recall? Yes, it and, was a modified uh, M1, I think. So what was the circumstances around that? Was what was what This was what blew everybody's mind. They were trying to figure out, well, was she forced into this? Is this something she's cooperating with? Talk about that. I know you talked around that, giving us the, the background. Yeah. Well, Patty Hearst, um, the reason she was kidnapped, according to Lake Headley, and affidavits he, he got from um, 30 different prisoners. Yeah. They're prisoners, but 30 different prisoners, none of whom knew each other, and all of whom knew that Patty was visiting DeFries. That affidavit says that um, Patty Hearst um, was a, you know, a secret radical using this phony ID, as I described. But her understanding was that DeFries, who was a radical leader, um, was going to break out of prison on his own not be allowed to escape. And he said to her, um, we're going to need money for the movement. What if, since you don't get along with your two sisters, what if we kidnap them? We don't harm them, but we get money from your dad, release them, and then we use money for the movement. And it was at this point where Patty's dalliance with DeFries ended, and she said, "I'm no, that's not acceptable, and I want nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. Well, DeFries wasn't, you know, very mentally stable at that point, and he became so infuriated with her that when he talked to Lieutenant James Nelson of the California Department of Corrections, who was logistically guiding this whole operation, uh, Nelson said, well, okay, so what you're going to do is going to go out there and run this organization, and we'll figure out what actions you'll take. And one of the first things DeFries said is, you know what I want to do? I want to kidnap Patty Hearst. And Nelson went, okay, mm. that's, that's something that we can talk about. Um, so Patty Hearst was not complicit in her kidnapping. 
And even though she was a secret radical, being thrown in a closet for 42 days or 44 days and being threatened and being told that you're going to be killed because now they want to kill us all, uh, she was physically molested by DeFries. There is some, in, this is a whole other discussion I won't get into, but there is some strong question about whether she actually was raped by DeFries and uh, another SLA member, Willie Wolf, who weirdly enough she said she loved, and then when she was caught and on trial said she hated. Mm. So the nature of her sexual relationships with DeFries and Willie Wolf when she was a kidnap victim are really gray and murky. But, the, but I maintain, despite all this, that she was not complicit in her kidnapping, and she should never have done time. How and much the, time? Finish your thought. Yeah, how, how much time did she get? Yeah. She was sentenced to seven years. But now here's where my own past sort of merges with the story. It's one of the reasons I had to write Revolution's End is I actually kind of rub shoulders with some of the people involved in the story. So... Leo J. Ryan was a representative from San Mateo, and that was uh, the county below San Francisco. Leo Ryan was the greatest adversary of the CIA in the history of the United States. He passed legislation demanding transparency from the CIA, which infuriated them. And Leo Ryan found out that at Vacaville, Donald DeFries had been a victim of behavior modification or mind control or whatever you want to call it. And that as a result of being at Vacaville, the SLA had been created by Colston Westbrook. Okay, this, again, this is not like some website that some guy is conjecturing. This is a representative of the United States Congress. So, yeah. so Representative Leo Ryan then goes to Jimmy Carter, the president, and he presents all of the intel that he has and says... Listen, apparently this SLA thing was a blown intelligence operation to deal with the radicals in the Bay Area. Patty Hearst had nothing to do with it. She didn't know who Donald DeFries was. It's not right that you lock her away for seven years. And the President of the United States, Alan, Jimmy Carter, looked at what a Representative Ryan gave him and said, you know what, this is absolutely right. There, there's, there's no doubt about your research on this. And he commuted her sentence to 22 months. He did the right thing. I remember that. A lot of people still upset with that. You know, they wanted her to suffer. Well, if they had known. See, that's the thing. People couldn't comprehend. Well, if you're robbing a bank with them, then you're no better than they right. are. But, you know, there has never been in a federal case a legal defense of mental coercion. And there certainly wasn't in the mid-'70s. So, you know, the the law team's hands were tied in defending her, Alan. It's like, well, we can't... Actually, I knew Terrence Hallinan, who was her first attorney when I lived in the Bay Area, and I talked with him while I was writing Revolution's End. And I remember sitting in his office on Franklin Street in San Francisco years ago, because I was fascinated, obviously, by this case. And I said, when you first were handling Patty's case before you got moved to the side by Randolph Hearst and F. Lee Bailey. I said, what was your actual defense going to be? And he said, mental coercion. I couldn't use brainwashing because brainwashing was only used in military trials in the United States at that point, And it would have been thrown out by the judge. So I couldn't say she had been brainwashed. My best... My best uh, defense, said Hallinan, was mental coercion, that she had been convinced that if she did not cooperate with them, that inevitably she would die anyway. And, of course, the family didn't want this uh, defense, and there was no defense saying, hey, it's a federal case of robbery, and... uh, this person, Patty Hearst, was not responsible for her mental state because of the way she was treated by these people. So there was no way that she was going to get off. But I maintain that legally she should have. 
It's just something in American jurisprudence that we still haven't dealt with. And, of course, because how often does this happen? This was, you know, a case, well, U.S. Attorney James Browning said, I think this is the first case of a, of a kidnap victim participating in a bank robbery. And he was probably right. It was an amazing period. It was shocking. Frank Zappa told me this back in the, in, he says back in the late 60s, this is uh, uh, from one of the interviews I did with him. He said back in the late 60s, uh, the CIA was, give, was giving LSD to the hippies and experimenting with mind control and had these little concentration camps or little places where if they lose their mind, they can put them. And I thought, well, if Zapp is saying something about this, something might be out there. About th- two or three years later, 60 Minutes does a whole thing on this. So this was a time when the government, the CIA, was specifically experimenting with American citizens, highly secretive, involving the government. And this must have been part of that. Well, I, I love that you bring up Frank Zappa, Alan, because I knew him. I was working with him for six months on a TV show called Night School that sadly never materialized. Yeah. But, but I, I guess there was a reason I got along with him, and that was because we were somewhat anti-authoritarian, both of us. And um, he, he was very, he came down very hard on the hippies because, you know, Zappa believed that if you're going to make America as just and as fair a place as possible, you can't withdraw and take drugs you have to be right very active politically right um and he never did that, for those who don't know not only frank zappa where people actually thought he did drugs just to come up with these amazing ideas never <laughs> did drugs never i remember no, he didn't. i remember uh when he when he was doing the uh uh joe's garage tour i mm-hmm. think and and some of the band members were putting towels down in the hotel room so he wouldn't smell the pot smoke because right. he was that against it. So, yeah, he was the real deal when he said he didn't do drugs. Continue. Yeah. Well, I, again, I'm just so pleased. I know it seems tangential, and we'll get back to Revolution's End, but just one more thing. Sure. Is, it, it just pleases me so because I loved and respected Frank. Uh, um, and I'm working on a book about music and political power, and one of the chapters is dedicated to Frank. And for your listeners, if you don't know his music, um, his biographer, Barry Miles, said, I'm the Slime, a brilliant song about anti-authoritarianism and free thought, is maybe one of the greatest political rock songs of all time. Absolutely. I totally agree. I I probably did, geez, I'm off the top of my head, maybe 15, 20 shows with him. And right up Great. until two weeks before uh, he died. And, uh, well, you know, he was a social cartoonist. He was a brilliant, amazing guitarist. He didn't care about commercial success. He, he, in fact, the thought of him editing one of his songs so he could get airplay repulsed him. And, uh-huh. and he just, that's why it was very few songs that really got to be on the radio on a regular basis because of the language. But anyway, yeah. yeah, we can go on. We got to talk about Zappa on uh, what you're writing. That's uh... <laughs> well, that'll come. Uh, that project yeah. is called Music Is Power, and I'll certainly keep you posted. But, but in terms of political power in in America, you know what happened at Vacaville, Alan, and the creation of the SLA was the tail end of a CIA project called MK Ultra, which uh, many people have probably read about. There have been many books and many documentaries about the use of drugs on witting and unwitting suspects by the CIA to see how much they could control people for intelligence operations. So it, it was the tail end of MK Ultra by the time the SLA happened in, in Vaca. Right. And, and, and by the way, they were busting the hippies at night, giving them the drugs, getting the drugs out in circulation during the day, and busting them at night so they can say, look at these hippies. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, go ahead. So, so technically, Vacaville was funded by a CIA uh, operation called MK Search. And um, if I go back to Representative Leo Ryan, who 
I actually met as a boy in the Bay Area and, and greatly respected. And sadly, he was murdered in Jonestown, Guyana, and that's a CIA operation as well. Um, Ryan was incredibly heroic, and not only did he, as I say, not help Jimmy Carter to commute Patty Hearst's sentence, Ryan knew and sort of made known the horrors at Vacaville. There is an existing document that Ryan got from Frank Carlucci, who was then the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Carlucci eventually became the director. But Carlucci, in this letter to Ryan, who was investigating, confirmed that there had been behavior modification uh, done via the CIA at Vacaville. He didn't tell him the whole story. He didn't mention all the drugs that were used. But I can tell you, in addition to the prolixin that, that DeFreeze had shot into him, there were some hideous drugs and hideous treatment of primarily black prisoners. Again, the reason that they didn't target Latino prisoners or white prisoners is because Reagan and Younger and Procunier went, look, these black prisoners are, are actually developing political power and manipulating all of the protesters outside of jails in the Bay Area. White, Chicano, black, doesn't matter. They're, they're looking to the black prisoners as a vanguard, so we have got to infiltrate them, and we've got to basically uh, nullify their effect by having this group that is totally irresponsible. And in fact, when DeFreeze was let out of prison, KQED-TV, the PBS affiliate in the Bay Area, and the San Francisco Chronicle interviewed radicals who said, hey, when Donald DeFries first got out before anything happened, he came to us and he asked if he could be a hitman for us. And we said, what the hell are you talking about? We don't hire hitmen to kill people. And then he reversed it and said, well, do you know, um, do you know where I can hire a hitman? This, is, this was documented. So clearly when they let DeFreeze out, of, it was Soledad that he escaped from, when they let him out, he was planning on behalf of his controllers to kill someone. And as it turned out, that person was the first black superintendent of schools in Oakland, Dr. Marcus Foster, who was murdered in November of 73 by DeFreeze and two of the white women in the SLA. And the reason that he was chosen over all the other supposed SLA targets, mm -hmm. you know, of the time, Alan, you know, a typical target would be the head of Standard Oil or the head of Wells Fargo Bank, you know, somebody, some quote-unquote fascist who, who represented you know, the, the corporate control of America. Um, parenthetically, it was one of the few things that the SLA made sense on, and if only they had been focused and didn't resort to violence and said, look, our country is now being controlled by the corporations. And, of course, it's even worse today. But instead, um, it w um, Dr. Marcus Foster was, was targeted because he was very liberal. He had the respect of the right as well as the left in Oakland, but the real defining aspect of his being targeted was that he was talking to the Black Panthers, right? who started in Oakland. By the way, it's the 50th anniversary of the Black Panthers starting in Oakland this year. Wow, and I know still to this day, for a generation of folks, when you say Black Panthers, to them, especially those at that time who were on the right, they would still look at that as anti-American and how could dare this, there's just a resentment, I think, against the Black Panthers. Not blacks in general, not saying they're racist, but when you hear Black Panther, you just yeah. don't think of a, a great organization, warm organization. I, w I want you to respond to that, but also how much of what was going on did Ronald Reagan know about? Well, no one can say exactly what he knew about. But think, of, think about this, 
Evel Younger may be one of the most militaristic attorney attorneys general in California history, if not U.S. history, had been involved in Air Force intelligence. And he literally, this is documented in, in all the newspapers of the time, Younger, who worked closely with Reagan in Sacramento, literally went to Raymond Procunier and, and took over the programs of the California Department of Corrections. Didn't fire Procunier, but said, I am now going to tell you what operations and what programs you're going to have for security in the prisons of California. And again, as I said, it was because they were fearful of political organizing. And after Younger decided to do that, then what happened at Vacaville with the freeze and the foundation of the SLA happened. So... Evel Younger had to know of the creation of the SLA, had to know about DeFreeze, had to know about William Herman, who was the counterintelligence advisor to Ronald Reagan. I can't imagine that Reagan did not know about the creation of the SLA based on all of the people I just described. Mm -hmm. It's it's fascinating because President Nixon tried to change the laws that made false statements regarding the SLA's number, intentions, and abilities uh, legal, I guess. Well, unfortunately, this is part of the destructive downside of, of the SLA. And why it was so effective is William Saxby, the U.S. Attorney General, um, for Nixon, as well as Younger, who I've been talking about, both had either, they either themselves spoke in the press or had underlings speak in the press. And those people lied. They literally said, we believe that the SLA is basically um, hundreds of people and that uh, there's going to be a revolution and they terrified people and gave, and painted a picture that the SLA was so well connected that we needed more draconian laws about sweeping up dissidents. So when the murder of Dr. Marcus Foster did not create an insurrection, as they hoped, so that you know the FBI and law enforcement in the Bay Area could then legally move on Black Panthers and groups like Vince Ramos, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and other people who clearly advocated the overthrow of the government. And while they weren't holding up banks, they had guns. And they were saying, you're not coming for us. We'll, we'll kill you before you take us away. All this was done to be able to legally arrest them. But the killing of Marcus Foster did not create an insurrection. Everyone condemned it, even the right said, why would anyone kill this decent man who everyone respected, the first black superintendent of schools in Oakland? So then, as you say, Alan, the attorneys general of of California and the United States then started spreading false stories about the strength of the SLA so they could enact laws. And that didn't work, thankfully, either. I mean, I... I don't know if you you were were around or knew about this or were alive, but I was. I remember being a very young kid thinking that California was completely insane, even though I lived in it, because they were advocating a bill in Sacramento that would allow rich people to use bodyguards, armed bodyguards, to prevent them from being kidnapped. There had yes. been one kidnap. A uh, Patty Hearst, a blown intelligence operation, and already they want a state law to protect people from crazy dissidents who are going to kidnap them. Manipulating the media to report exactly what the image is they're trying to present. But what still heck is in my mind is how yeah. when they had this shootout and they blew up that uh, uh, on TV, I think they, they burned down, five people yeah. got killed, and... 
the fire department wasn't allowed to put out the fire, and this was something that the CIA was behind. The LAPD was on the scene. Well, not the CIA, not, but the but remember, Donald DeFries had been you know an informant for the criminal conspiracy section of the LAPD. So Lake, we go back to Lake Headley, who wrote Vegas PI and was hired to investigate this. He did amazing work, and I found in the archives of a small college in Minnesota, um, all these reports. And it's mind-boggling what went on in South Central. The most important thing, you know, most of Revolution's End is, is reportage based on stuff that was already published, and a lot of it 40 years ago. It's not even new. But the one thing that I'm contributing to the narrative that I'm very proud about is absolute proof that an incendiary device was used by the LAPD to burn that house to the ground. And they did that because the last thing they wanted was Donald DeFreeze being captured alive, going to trial, <laughs> and then telling a court, well, let me tell you about when I was uh, you know, infiltrating Black Panthers for the LAPD. Oh, let me tell you about the drugs that they were using on black prisoners in Vacaville. Let me tell you about Colston Westbrook and his work for the CIA. That's the last thing they wanted. Therefore, they needed a context to wipe them out. There was a working phone in 1466 East 54th Street. They never bothered using it. And the proof is the L.A. Times. Again, not some obscure radical publication. The L.A. Times ha had proof in a story that they threw something called a Federal 555 tear gas projectile, the LAPD did, into the house. They'd been shooting other flight right tear gas projectiles. Well, here's the thing that just boggles my mind, Alan. The press didn't do their job that well, I'm sorry to say. Because when I read the LA Times article, the first thing I did was go on Google and okay, there was no Google in 1974, but you, you know, you could have called up federal laboratories and said, tell me about your federal 555 tear gas projectile. If they had done so, they would have found out that it is not a tear gas projectile. It's what's called a pyrotechnic grenade. And it's used only for outdoor riot control because it is highly flammable. And the manufacturer, and in fact, the head of the company, Don Peace, <laughs> there's a laugh. The guy who created it or, or, or ran the company is, is P-E-A-C-E. -E. Nice. Don Peace tells the L.A. Times, um, no, actually the 555 is not meant for um, indoor use. But then he realizes, oh, my God, what am I saying? I'm condemning the LAPD. And he immediately goes, but the LAPD didn't do anything wrong. Oh, so he was absolutely terrified because he was admitting that they used something to purposely burn the house and then realized, oh, my God, what's going to happen to me and my company if I publicly condemn the LAPD? And the media is probably saying, well, if the gov back then, well, if the, if the government's behind this, uh, you, you know, there must have been a good reason, and they just kind of drop it, I guess. I don't know. Of course they did. These, these were radicals on the run. It wasn't hard to right. condemn them. And... There's so many other things connected to uh, the shootout and fire, but I, I kind of have a little bit of pride about being the guy who pretty much categorically proved that they burned the house to the ground. Yeah. And, that, and remember, that was after a 45-minute firefight. This book, uh, uh, meticulously researched, documented, uh, and it's just, uh, wow, what a great piece of work. You really did some great work on in exposing this. It's called Revolution's End. And I have one more question. Brad yeah. Schreiber is what we're, who we're talking to. Bringing us up to today. Yeah. And God, this is going to be a hard question to kind of put all together because he can't answer it with a, with a snappy question. Based on this history and what's happening today with police— and with a presidential candidate talking about law and order, uh, mm -hmm. bringing back uh, 
when America was great again without giving right. a specific. I don't know what decade he's talking about. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, just give us uh, your overview of what's yeah. happening in this country. Well, you know, as we said earlier on this wonderful interview, and I've so enjoyed the opportunity to talk to you about Alan, um, I would say, again, the beginning of police militarization was after that shootout and fire in May of 74. But don't forget that the Pentagon had its 1033 program uh, in, in, I believe, the, the late 90s, where they were giving away you know, armored personnel carriers and automatic weapons to police departments who wanted it as surplus. Donald Trump is talking about law and order with absolutely no sense of nuance or the history of racism in America. And I was extremely pleased, even though I, you know, I don't want to get into a critique of either of these people, but just based on their words, Hillary Clinton actually talked about the idea of training, not only of, of black citizens being aware of, and I think they're very aware of the dangers that exist when they're stopped by police, but also the idea of how do you train police to deal with stops. If there is not only no legal, if there's nothing legal that, that the police fear about what they do wrong, and admittedly they don't usually do things wrong, but if there's nothing legal to prevent them, that's part of the problem. Yes. If you want to address the problem, the problem is about community policing. It's about communication between the black community and police, and it's about training of those officers, including psychological training. And I did hear Hillary Clinton talk about very gently that idea of training, and I think it's absolutely crucial. The training is huge. You're absolutely right. And I, I'm sorry. I, of course, I've never had any problems with the law. I, you know, police. I know if I have friends who are police or were police. But when you stop somebody and you start yelling, get out! Hey, no, no, no. Don't do this! Don't you move! Freeze! Get, hey, you're someone, someone screams, especially if they don't have a uniform on, and you're just... What? You could get a heart attack. You're scared. You don't know who these people are. Yeah. People, yeah. we're not going to do the rational thing sometimes. I don't understand this heavy-handed approach. Well, I don't it get it. About law. It isn't just law and order, you know. It's, it's about dialogue and not, and not just going to the place of blame, but going, okay, let's make a deal. See, that's what America has turned into, a place where people argue with each other, and at the end of the argument... There's been no conclusion, no compromise. Just like you've got to pass a bill in Congress by compromise, the whole issue of policing and, and black citizens, um, that's about compromise and creating programs. And it's never going to get better until we start really doing that. Good point. Brad Schreiber. Brad Schreiber, S. I'm sorry, yeah, S-C-H-R-E-I-B-E-R, -E -E bradschreiber.com is the website. And this book just out, Revolutions and the Patty Hearst Kidnapping, Mind Control, and the Secret History of Donald DeFreeze and the SLA. Well, congratulations. What a, a, a great uh, segment. It was great having you back on the show. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it, Alan.